Could I make all of this up? <laughs> Could anybody make all of this? So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to take orders for sweatshirts with FUBA <laughs> fouled up beyond all recognition. <laughs> Wow. I think we could sell a lot of t-shirts, sweatshirts, we could go into business. Maybe even baseball hats. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, I've put on the board an agenda for the uh, um, class uh, for today. We don't have to make this decision now. If some of you want to stay after 2 o'clock, um, I'd be willing to uh, continue whatever discussion uh, we may be on or to go back to some of the things. As I say, it's a discussion we don't, decision we don't need to make now. Uh, but <clears throat> it's just amazing. Six days in politics is a lifetime. And I think I, I know I used this quote, I think, last week. Mr. Churchill's line, in politics, you can be killed many times. How many times can you be killed? Every day it can happen. So what we've seen in the last, since we last met, is amazing. Uh, I want to begin by talking about Mr. Comey, <laughs> are we comatose? I thought that was kind of cute. <laughs> you don't have to like it. Um, and then a little bit about dirty tricks. We got a lot of those. Um, and then the state of the race, polling. Like this. Those handcuffs are getting tighter again. The Electoral College, is a lot to talk now about the possibility of 269 to 269, or uh, maybe if Mr. McMullen can pull off a victory in Utah, preventing anyone from getting a majority in the Electoral College, that would be fun. Um, and then at the end, to take a straw vote, secret ballot. I'm going to take all these votes home, have more than a couple of drinks, and then come back next week and announce uh, the winner. It's a huge prize. And uh, so, um, huge, right? Right. So, uh, let's start uh, with, Mr. With, with, uh, with Mr. Comey. I don't know where else to begin. No, he's a giant of a man. He's six foot eight inches tall. Um, and uh, he's had a very interesting career. Uh, this, which is on the, um, uh, which is on the uh, screen, is the memo that he wrote to the FBI. That is to say, he sent the letter to Congress, which I'm going to try and put up afterwards. Uh, but this is the letter he wrote to his fellow FBI people <laughs> explaining why he wrote the earlier letter. And uh, I think actually some of the same um, language is used uh, here. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have somebody else. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is the, uh, uh, is, is there somebody else talking? Yes, yeah, sorry, me. Thank you, Brian. So, um, he start, of course we don't ordinarily tell Congress about ongoing investigations. Now, f many, dozens actually, of uh, former senior DOJ Department of Justice people on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, have indicated that uh, this policy has been in place for years at the Department of Justice. Um, that is to say, not uh, reporting 
uh, to anyone about ongoing investigations. But here I feel an obligation to do so. Uh, and he says, again, what he said in the first letter, which was, given that we don't know the significance of this newly discovered collection, I don't want to create a misleading impression. So he doesn't want to create a misleading impression. And yes. Yeah, I just I saw Joe Walsh, who is a, was the uh, very uh, strident Tea Party representative from Illinois, and uh, he was on one of the uh, talk shows saying that, that he thought this was a terrible thing for Foley to have done. Uh, he said even though it serves his party as an American, he thinks that was a terrible thing to do. So I just thought that was interesting. So. Uh, I hope. Here we go. I'm just going to put the letter up. <laughs> These are all the people to whom we sent it. Just kind of interesting. All of the um, committee chairs to whom we sent it are Republican because they're the majority, of course. And so then there's the letter, and then on the second page, which of course nobody ever turned to, he had the list of Democrats who had also received it. In any event, this is the letter, uh, and as you can see, some of this uh, uh, language uh, is uh, the same. Um, I think before and I haven't really seen this anywhere, but it's interesting to step back and get, you know, who is Jim Comey? And what's the history here? Why, you know, can we get anything from a, con a contextual reading and history? Well, it turns out that Mr. Comey has a long history with the Clintons. Back in the 90s, during an investigation which you may recall, called Whitewater, <laughs> wow. Mr. Comey was a deputy counsel to the Senate committee that investigated the Clintons. Now, that investigation went on, it seemed, for 30 years. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't quite, but it was a very long time. And when it was over, and we're not going to get into it today, fortunately, when it was over, the Clintons, and Hillary was a subject of that investigation at that time, the Clintons were never charged with anything. They were cleared. There were other people who were charged, and who went to jail, and who were later pardoned. And you'll recall the unfortunate death of Vince Foster, who was somehow involved in all of that. And that still hangs around as a conspiracy theory uh, that people, certain people like to go back to. But what's interesting is that after the Clintons were clear, there was a report issued by the um, staff of the committee, which blasted the Clintons for most of the things from which they were cleared. So this concept of saying, I don't have enough information, excuse me, this concept of saying, I will not charge these, this person or these people with any violation of the law, but I want you to know that they're terrible people. Yeah. <laughs> that is exactly, so that's the first thing. Yes, Mark? I was going to say that in the summertime, when <coughs> Comey reported on indict or don't indict or do not prosecute, he came out and said that the, there was no prosecutable offense, right. and then he turned around, which to me was very out of, very inappropriate, he turned around and, and the words 
made the case for blasting the Clintons. Yes, and that was. Which to me was very inappropriate. If either you prosecute or you don't. If you don't, you just keep your mouth shut. And I think, again, that press conference, which was, I think my own personal opinion is, was quite bizarre, led then to the congressional hearings. Uh, because co congressional people said, well, you've said they were terrible people. She was a terrible person. Why didn't you indict her? That's, that was really the bottom line. So this letter is yet another step in this uh, discussion. Now, so that's the first uh, little bit of history with the Clintons. The second piece of history with the Clintons I don't know whether you'll remember the name Mark Rich. Well, Mark Rich was, was very rich, and he was indicted and convicted of some very serious crimes. He was out of the country and basically gone. Who conducted that investigation? Well, Mr. Comey conducted that investigation. He was the district attorney in New York, where Rich was convicted, and Comey personally prosecuted that case. And you'll recall, Bill Clinton pardoned Mark Rich as one of the very last things he did in office. So that's another interesting connection between the Clintons and Mr. Comey. Andrea? Who does Comey report to? Well, that's a nice question. Technically, he reports to the Attorney General. And, and so she's the person who Clinton met with on the plane to talk about That's correct. And that is, a, is another important point here. We've talked about unforced errors throughout this course. How could Bill Clinton have gotten onto that plane on that tarmac in that airport in broad daylight and not known that someone would have caught it. So that's a, another point. George? Hey, uh, something that I just realized within the last couple of weeks, I guess I've forgotten his name, but it was he who raced to the hospital when John Ashcroft. Yes. Uh, was uh, in uh, close to death, I guess. <coughs> people from uh, um, White House, Dick, Dick Cheney's staff, <coughs> right? Uh, were trying to get Ashcroft to sign off on something that only knew was wrong, and it had to do with was uh, with spying on people and so. Well, so let's just pursue that for a moment because that's an important point. A very substantial part of Mr. Comey's reputation is based on that famous night. I say famous because uh, uh, it didn't come out really. That happened in 2004, as I recall. And I think the story of that night didn't come out until 2007. And uh, when uh, Mr. Comey told that story, uh, while testifying uh, before a committee in Congress, and he made that sound like, you know, he was the Lone Ranger. Actually, he was not the Lone Ranger. There were several other people with him. Uh, it is true that Gonzalez, who was the AG, and Andy Card, who was uh, Bush's uh, chief of staff, uh, were, were trying to get Ashcroft to sign off on an extension of a law that permitted the government to do a certain kind of spying on domestic citizens under certain circumstances. And Comey was concerned about some of the language in the law. And in fact, that night, nothing happened. Uh, Comey uh, was successful in getting uh, the uh, card and Gonzalez out of the room and nothing happened. But what, to the best of my knowledge, nobody talks about is that three weeks after that event, Mr. Comey signed the law 
with minor technical modifications that he said he ran to the hospital to stop Ashcroft from signing. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. It was after changes were made. Yes, there were changes made. Absolutely. Um, yes. How long is he in office for? And how does he get this? Well, so, so let me just finish this up. So, you know, the FBI has a very interesting history in our country. It'd be a great cause. Um, you know, Mr. Hoover, for 40 some odd years, uh, you know, was a, a very important public figure in this country. And going back to the 20s, you know, with uh, Babyface Nelson and John Dillinger, you know, the FBI was out to do, quote unquote, the right thing. Well, it turned out that there were many things they did that people were not uh, too crazy about. And of course, uh, at the end, after Mr. Hoover resigned, and particularly after he died, uh, there were many unpleasant things that came out and et cetera. Well, it turns out the FBI actually has had 17, 17 directives. I counted them. And uh, which seemed to me a lot because Hoover was there for 45 years. <laughs> and the FBI isn't all that old. Six of those, six or seven of those people have been acting directors for periods literally of a few months to maybe a year. So there have been about 11 other directors. The person who served next longest to Hoover was Bob Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, who served for 12 years, and he was appointed, uh, he was the director before, just before uh, Comey, and he served for 10 years, and Obama went looking for someone to do this job, and literally couldn't find anybody. Think about it. <laughs> um, so they got a two-year extension from Congress, from Mueller, while Obama searched, and he came up with James Comey. Now Comey is a, was a Republican and contributed to Republican candidates. Bill Clinton, in 1992, appointed a guy named Lewis Free to be the director of the FBI. You may or may not remember him. He was a Republican. And Mr. Clinton was very sorry that he appointed Mr. Free to be the director of the FBI. And I think Mr. Obama has been relatively quiet. I think I heard he did make a couple of comments. But I think this, this appointment is an interesting uh, appointment. So, let me just give you, uh, again, in running through, uh, what, what has Mr. Comey been doing since he's been director? Remember, the FBI is not a prosecutor, prosecutorial agency. They are an investigative agency. So, um, but, if you look over the last three years, since Mr. Comey has been director, he has been on a very extensive speaking schedule around the country. Uh, and what has he been talking about? Well, he's been talking about the fact that he thinks this Black Lives Matter uh, movement is a terrible mistake here in America that um, uh, the whole business coming out of Ferguson has put the police under a microscope and is leading to an uptick in crime in this country. And he's gone around the country speaking about that. Uh, he has spoken against sentencing reform that this administration has tried to uh, move forward in the Congress. He has spoken against changes in cybersecurity <coughs> laws. Um, he has spoken about the critical need in small towns in America, small towns in America, to be concerned about ISIS infiltration. 
Does he have any information about this? I have no idea. And he has talked about the gaps in the screening process in our country for Syrian refugees. Does he have any recommendations for changes? I have no idea. And you'll recall that fuss about uh, whether Apple should uh, provide the government with the information to unlock iPhones. Mr. Comey was the one who went after Apple uh, to try to get them uh, to change that policy. Now, I simply put that out as information. And uh, I think uh, that uh, the word, I saw, I saw this word used in a couple of articles. Uh, people who have known Mr. Comey in the past who have said that he was quote unquote self-righteous in his uh, attitudes and policies in his previous positions uh, and that they were quote unquote surprised when he was appointed uh, to this position. I also saw uh, uh, an article the last couple of days uh, that said that he had been very disturbed um, before this letter uh, that of the reaction he was getting from many members of the FBI staff because of his decision, his decision not to uh, recommend indicting Hillary Clinton. So as he was walking through the halls and he would say hello to these people, they ignored him. <laughs> and uh, the story was that he went home and said to his wife, I don't know what I'm gonna do about this. Well, my only comment about that is, you know, it, it's Harry Truman's old line. If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. This is a, this is a d damn big job in this country. It's a very important job. You're six foot eight, Suck it up, kid. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, you know. So anyway, uh, uh, I think, now, has this had any effect or impact? What do you think? I mean, the, the, we're going to talk about the polls in a few minutes. Um, but, Sam? When he said that he didn't think he had evidence to indict, you know, he's acting like he's person doing the indictment. So what did the Attorney General actually say? Did they ever go so far as to look at what he's got and say uh, yes or no? <laughs> well, the problem, Andrea brought up this point, the problem that was created by Mr. Clinton was that because of that meeting, the Attorney General recused herself from discussions of that matter and she said, and she said publicly, that she would go along with whatever recommendation he made. So, uh, excuse me, she's not doing her job either. Her job is to investigate what the FBI has done. Well, I think she was, I think, between a rock and a hard place. I, I, I think, as you go through that, it's very good, but I think we should keep sight of the fact that when the decision was made, the, the word among the folks in Washington was that Mr. Comey did not want to sway the election and select the next president the same way the Supreme Court did in the Bush versus Gore decision. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that the Supreme Court lost some standing because they took that decision, which was legal, it was fine, but there are a lot of people who felt that the public should select the next president, not the Supreme Court. Mr. Comey made the decision not to indict because had he done that at that time, it would have been the same as the FBI, in effect, selecting the next president. I think we, you, know, if, if you can't have an indicted person running for president. It would be pretty awkward. So he made the decision not to put the FBI into that position. And everybody applauded him. Throughout the campaign, the, Mrs. Hitt, Mrs. Clinton has continued to say, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm, I've done no wrong. Look what they said they weren't going to indict. That's not what they said. They said they wouldn't indict, but she was careless, she was a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. He also, under oath, 
said that if there was any change in the status, he would let the Congress know. Had he not told the Congress, now, he didn't need a public letter, he could have done this behind mm -hmm. scenes and let the, let the Congress leave it, which is what would have happened, that then he would have not been subject to all the innuendos that are going on now. Yes? In regard to the comments of careless and, and reckless, Can you speak up, oh, I'll try. In regards to the comments that you referred to as careless and reckless, it is his job as an investigator to state whether there's a case to go forward, not to give his personal opinion on it. Yes, ma'am. And also, isn't it when there are no charges forthcoming, you don't make an announcement that there's no charges forthcoming. You don't say anything. And also, his press conference wasn't a press conference. He didn't take questions. He made an announcement on television. So he got to say what he wanted to say. So the other thing that's kind of interesting, and again, you take with this what you want. He did tell Congress that the investigation was at an end. And However, it was not technically closed. One of the things we keep hearing on the campaign trail is that the investigation was reopened, but that is not what this says. Now, it may be reopened, or it may not be reopened, but I think, you know, I think that what happened here is that the statement that he made on television, followed by the congressional hearings that everybody saw, followed by this letter, uh, which, you know, comes from a most unfortunate uh, laptop uh, ownership, uh, is just you know, there's no way to measure what impact this has had. Clearly, I think we would all agree it's not a positive thing for the Clinton campaign. So how bad it is, is I think up to interpretation. The polls seem to be uh, kind of all around. Yeah, I don't know if there's anyone here who uh, is, is uh, very good technically with computers. But I am puzzled. It said there were 650,000 emails on this computer, and I don't understand that. And then also, Huma Abedi said, in, in her recollection, she had not used that computer. It should not have had any of her emails, or she would have turned it over. How is that possible? <clears throat> or is it? Well, I don't know. I, I certainly am not a techie. I have no idea. I do know that with the few devices that we have, that somehow through the iCloud, there are things that seem to float from one machine to another that I'm completely clueless about. It would seem to me that 650,000 emails would be, a, would be a big drop. <laughs> so I don't know. Somebody who hasn't talked yet. Yes? I, I heard what you said about the FBI, inside the FBI, that being angry that she wasn't indicted. But I've heard recently that there are many people in the FBI, inside the FBI who are angry at what Comey did. Yes, right after that is absolutely true. Statement. And that was one of the reasons why, apparently, these people were literally not talking to him. Um, and so, you know, that's like the second grade. <laughs> now, what do you mean they're not talking to you? It's right. I heard on the NPI that the Attorney General told him not to, not to leak this, or not to make this last statement, straight on, person to person, that he could not do this this particular topic. And he made the decision to go ahead and do it. There seems to be some confusion about whether there was a direct conversation or not. I originally gathered that there was, and then I saw some language that they had never actually conversed, but this had been communicated, not only by the Attorney General, but by the Deputy Attorney General, who had also agreed that this was not a good thing. And he did decide to do this on his, on his own in direct contravention. Emma? Oh, well, I think he must be closing in on the end of his 10-year appointment, <laughs> but uh, it's, I believe that Loretta Lynch will actually 
probably step down before Comey's term ends. Well, Comey has a 10-year term. Yeah. And so where, where he's only he served three years. years. Oh, three now, years. Now, he's only served three years. Now, let me say, there seems to be no question. This is not like a federal judgeship where you're appointed by life as a 10-year term. But there seems to be no reason why a president couldn't fire the director of the FBI uh, without any approval from anyone. Um, so is, is Mr. Obama likely to do that? I think not. Uh, would Hillary Clinton do it if she were elected? I, will Mr. Trump do it if he's elected? I suspect not. So in any event, uh, but it, it could happen. He's not insulated and protected for the balance of the seven years or whatever. Any other comments? I, I just uh, heard on the news before I got here that Donald Trump is telling people in Florida if he voted early to get the back get the ballots back since this all this information has come out about the email since it's worse than Watergate to revote to revote yeah. so let me just comment on that quickly there are there are actually I believe four states I think there are four states where you can actually uh, uh, revote if you know, you can locate your absentee ballot, or the state can locate it, and pull it, then you would be allowed to vote on election day. But there's a process that's involved here. So, as I say, there are four, I don't recall who they are, but uh, there is a, a very... Hmm? They're all northern, I think it's Wisconsin. They're all up in that area, Pennsylvania. Anyway, so that's a, a so I'd like to move along here, Andrea. Just one quick comment, so I'm just getting it on my phone. So Obama did go public and she sharply criticized um, uh, COVID. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. In New Hampshire, if you get an absentee ballot and you mail it in, those absentee ballots are counted on the day of, of the election. election. You can walk in. And you can say, I want, I changed my mind, I want the absentee ballot that I sent in. You show sure that. That you are that person? You can, you can pull it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the benefit of having same day registration, among other things. But that's interesting to hear. Anything else that on this? Because we're, we've got a few other things to talk about. Um, I do wonder. Yes. Why hasn't he come out and said anything about Trump to make it somewhat... Well, you know, that raises another interesting question. That because part of the discussion has been that there were possibly investigations that were going on inside the FBI about a Trump connection to Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul Manafort's connection, which was a direct or indirect connection, and the story was, one, this was very preliminary, and two, he didn't want to impact the election. So I think that's part of the discourse. And I think part, this will always be, when this election is over, if it's ever over, and somebody is writing the history, this whole episode will be a major chapter, uh, I can promise because there'll be, he said, she said, we said, they said, I thought, you thought. Now, we haven't really, you know, the, our famous words, I think, are as important and relevant as they've ever been. Change, which was real change, which was the message that uh, Trump was certainly running on. Uh, crisis, uh, you know, we've got six days left. Is Comey going to come out with something else? I mean, nobody knows. What's he going to find? Are those the same emails that they already found on uh, when they were looking at Clinton's server? I have no idea. Um, but will he come out and say something else? Uh, can he say anything else that doesn't 
frankly, you know, look, just kind of make things worse. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, WikiLeaks. I mean, every week, he's still in the Ecuadorian embassy. He keeps promising there's another tranche of emails. Uh, I think we're going to see something. How can it be worse? Uh, I don't know. Uh, a domestic attack, heaven forbid, something happens uh, somewhere in this country. Um, uh, could that impact the election? I think it could. Uh, if, you know, this, this uh, operation is going on in, in Mosul, if there's a disaster in Mosul, uh, if the, you know, the rebel forces are beaten back and ISIS wins a major victory, I think that's not helpful to the Clinton campaign. So, uh, and then, and we're going to talk, really, we're going to move on to this now, uh, turnout. Uh, so when we get to uh, the state of the race, we'll get to that. Just quickly on dirty tricks. You know, we've had dirty tricks in American politics almost from the beginning. The only reason there weren't dirty tricks during George Washington's reign was because nobody ran against him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that made it, there wasn't much sense. Believe me, they had plenty of unpleasant things. There were people who had unpleasant things to say. But uh, uh, there have been dirty tricks forever. And as we look back at some of them there, they're funny now, they weren't funny then, or maybe they're not so funny, but in any event, it was humor of the, uh, of the 1800s. So most recently, you may recall, I think it was 72, uh, when Mr. Kissinger, uh, with a week to go in the election, uh, came on television and he said, uh, kind of uh, rephrasing an old quote, peace is at hand. That was an absolute and total lie. An absolute and total lie. There was no peace at hand. And uh, in 92, I think, during that campaign, um, uh, there was a, um, there was a, re a, a revelation that, uh, oh, his name escapes me, the guy who was Secretary of Defense at the time, Casper Weinberg, Casper Weinberg was, had been involved previously uh, with the Iran-Contra affair. And uh, so that was an attempt at dropping a quote-unquote bomb uh, kind of at the last minute. And then in the Bush-Gore race, you'll recall that with a few days to go, the revelation came out that Mr. Bush had been arrested for drunk driving uh, much earlier in his, uh, in his life. And uh, so that was another revelation that uh, actually, uh, you know, came about. And there have been a lot more things that have been worse, perhaps, than those just described. We've talked about this business of voter caging, which is going on now in North Carolina without question. They, they had mailed these uh, uh, <clears throat> materials to in ethnic neighborhoods. When they came back, moved, no, no person like that here. These people were removed from the voting rolls, and when they come to vote, they are not on those rolls and they don't have the necessary registration information to vote. That's already happened. And we've said that the Republican Party is subject to a consent decree which prevents this very thing. Is anything going to happen? I have no way of knowing. Is anything going to happen before the election? Absolutely no. not. One of the other things that happened in North Carolina is that in some of these precincts, or voting districts, if it wasn't the precinct, the number of precinct, the number of voting places was reduced in one case from 16 voting places to one voting place. So that these people had to come from a much greater distance uh, in order to vote. And this has come out because North Carolina is a state where there's a very heavy 
uh, early voting rate. And the ethnic minority in North Carolina, that voting rate is well down. And one of the reasons it's down is because of those tactics. So those kinds of things are going on. And I promise you there will be more of that on election day in many places in this country. Yes? Nothing surprises me anymore about this whole thing. What would happen if something like Mr. Trump loses but refuses to concede or it goes beyond Inauguration Day? Will we be a country without a leader at that point? Well, I think, no, we won't be. First of all, a concession speech is not a legal requirement. But we're going to talk about that issue a little later on, so if you'll hold it. I think we won't be leaderless. Um, I mean, Mr. Obama stays on until January 20th. The Congress stays on until January 3rd. Uh, so whatever. But we're, we're going to get to that when we talk about the Electoral College. So anything else on dirty tricks? I, I, this is, a, I think, a quick one. Yes, Bev? Going back to Comey, if he said last summer that this didn't meet the standard for prosecution, it was sloppy, but it didn't meet the standard, which was a high, a high bar, he said, what in these emails would he hope to find that then would meet the standard? I can't answer that question. Uh, I, I, but I think that uh, my guess is, you know, kind of more of the same. Um, and so, Sam, you had your hand up. Go ahead. You mentioned the, the dirty tricks in North Carolina. I just wondered, is North Carolina one of the states that had the, um, where the yes. rigorous investigation under the Civil Rights Act? Yes. So, so that, these are the kind of things that are happening now. But these are things that are happening now, even though everybody's been all through this. And uh, it wouldn't be happening though if they were still under that. If no, they, they are still under it. Oh, they are. They are. Oh, I thought they got it. So no. So let's look at this because I mean this is where the rubber meets the road. So I can remember when Hillary's chances on this chart were over ninety percent, um, and as you can see. They are now down to uh, 70%. You, I think most of you will know, many of you will know, that Nate Silva got his start as a sports nut who, uh, you know, had, had uh, odds for games and predictions and all. He still does that, actually. Um, and last week, after Cleveland won the third game of the series, he said, I quote, the odds of Mr. Trump winning the election are the same as the Cubs winning the World Series. Oh. And tonight, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> and, to, and tonight, <laughs> the Cubs could win the World Series. So uh, he also said, in, in, in something that I picked up yesterday somewhere, that the odds for Trump winning the election were the same as throwing a coin in the air three times and having it come up the same way three times. This morning, before I left here, I threw a quarter up three times and I got three tails. Uh, was that your one-sided uh, yeah, one coin? <laughs> That's my scientific survey. So, uh, so much for so much for Nate Silva. So anyway, uh, here we are, and uh, I think you know this is. Let's let's move this down here. Look at the popular vote. Um, we're down now. He still has the uh, the elect. He still has Hillary at 301. I think I, I think at one point she was up to about 350. But here, we're down to three points, more or less, between three and four. He's got Johnson, again, below 5%. And remember, if they don't get 5%, then this whole exercise was a waste of time for them. 
um, because he needs 5% in order to generate funds for the next election. Um, and so let's take a look. Here are the famous couplets. And as you can see here, these are moving, if you're a Clinton fan, they're moving in the wrong direction. Um, and uh, they show a coming together. We go back here. You'll look here how close this got. Uh, if the momentum continues, what's that song? We're slip, slip, sliding away. Is this election slip, slip, sliding away? It could be. It could be. Um, and uh, so, as I say, six days is a lifetime. And uh, so let's see uh, what, what's happening in the states here, because uh, obviously that's, uh, that's where it is. So <clears throat> here we go, Florida very close. Uh, North Carolina, very close. Ohio, this is definitely Republican. I've said that now for a while. Ohio is, is, is definitely going Republican. Um, and uh, so, you know, Trump has been campaigning in Michigan, uh, and uh, Hillary was in, is in Arizona. I mean, I have to say, I don't, you know, I don't get that. And Arizona is no place for her to be at this point in time, in my opinion. Uh, the Trump campaign may have inside information on Michigan and Wisconsin. I don't know. But uh, in any event, uh, and I still feel, and I said this many weeks ago, if by any chance New Hampshire goes for Trump, I don't think it will, but if it does, that is very, very bad news, because that, in my mind, will indicate a depth uh, of feeling uh, that uh, the polls have been unable to measure. And that goes to another important point, this whole idea of there being a silent uh, group within this country that is going to go out and vote for Trump that has not publicly uh, disclose this to anybody, including their wives, um, and they're just going to do it. So, you know, we come back here to the turnout, millennials, uh, Hispanic, uh, Afro-American, somebody just told me about a, uh, a discussion they heard last night about what was going on in Florida and early voting, and it seemed to be very positive for Hillary, Republicans voting for Hillary down there. I heard something yesterday, I don't know if any of you saw it, a woman who was leading the Hillary uh, Afro-American uh, uh, program in Florida, and she said right out, that's dead in the water. The African-Americans in Florida are not coming out for Hillary in a big way. It's not happening. Way below what it needs to be. She said that she told the campaign three months ago that it wasn't happening and they basically ignore it. So, uh, now, these are very different kinds of results. I, th I think I sent, a, and I sent an email yesterday about uh, the Gallup poll, which is a, um, a, a poll um, on whether the candidates have the right uh, characteristics, et cetera, to be president and Trump. 67% of the people they uh, they talked to said that Trump did not have the whatever those characteristics are. Gallup has been taking this poll for 40 years and they've never had ever a 67 percent negative rating. Then we saw the ABC uh, Washington Post poll, which has been a very highly regarded poll, which showed Hillary seven or eight days ago, 12 points ahead, and yesterday she was one point behind. So how do you square all this stuff? Um, yes? I think that 67% says it all. I really think that the end, and if it happens, I really 
a lost state in my country, um, that, you, that anybody in their right mind, quote unquote, could ever vote for a, a, a despicable person. Well, oh, 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 oh. I think we have we have a few people in this room, uh, so I, I, I think we need to be careful. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think you know it's this old business about you know. We don't talk about politics, sex, and religion. All we do is drink. So, <laughs> what I really meant was the 67% who said he was not qualified. I, I, I apologize for what That's you said. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Does it keep comparing the Democrats to the Republicans? Because the African-American turnout to 08 and to 12. Yes. I'd love to know what it was in 04. Because it might be just back at that point, and other, all the previous years. Obviously, with Obama, he got a large turnout. Well, I think that's that's probably a fair question. Um, I, I think the, I can't give it to you off the top of my head, um, but clearly the 08, 012 numbers were skewed by um, Obama's presence on the ticket. The Clinton hope was that uh, she would be able to maintain, uh, or come close to maintaining, that uh, majority. What happened to um, this voter ID business in states supposedly have knocked out a lot of... They've tried. Yeah! Actually, Donald, uh, one, a spokesman for Trump's campaign made a statement to a Bloomberg reporter that the Trump campaign had three major voter suppression efforts in place. Uh, Afro-Americans uh, was one. Um, I'll have to find it for you. But um, anyway, I thought, I mean, it was interesting that they actually admitted that they had these suppression uh, I'll find it during the break. Uh, that they had these. So this is the, uh, you know, this is what the electoral college uh, might, uh, the electoral votes might look like. Um, and then I, I want to want to move this along because I want to move off of 538 here before we take a break. Uh, so. This is the 269 line right here in Colorado. So this means, this means that if Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, and Nevada all go for Trump, that Hillary still could win if, in fact, she took Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, uh, etc. So. You know, this is where we are. And yes, sir. There was a discussion last night about uh, essentially the uh, exit polls for Republican women. Supposedly, 28% of Republican <coughs> women were voting for Hillary. And the, the point of emphasis seemed to be A, that changed. And is it going to be replicated throughout the country? The other thing was, the other major point was that if Trump doesn't win Florida, he's cooked. Uh, he, that, that chart seemed to say, yeah. no, he's not necessarily cooked. I think. Because uh, you're pointing out the other states that would have to fall into place. Yeah. So I think that. Uh, but there seems to be. So the other thing uh, that I want to, and I guess maybe we'll stop after, we'll take our break. The, the other point is, you know, the national polls are one thing. The state polls are something else. And some of these polls are much better than others. For reasons that I can't explain to you, some states have a, have a, there are pollsters who are doing some states much more often in a much better way than they're doing other states. I can't explain that to you. I don't know why. 
But that, in fact, is the case. So in Pennsylvania, uh, in, uh, I think in Michigan, uh, in Ohio, uh, obviously swing states, but they're doing a, uh, you know, they're polling constantly. And uh, I think they're polling in New Hampshire. I never answer the phone. So, uh, but uh, I believe that they're polling here. So let's take, let's take a break here. I want to come back and, and we'll, we'll look at the New York Times numbers. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Electoral College. Uh, there's a modest, very modest chance that, you know, uh, as I said before, if Mr. McMullen won in Utah, uh, and those six votes came off the came off the table, that if this election were really very close, that it could be thrown into the House of Representatives, and that really is a nightmare from which we may never recover. So let me ask you one thing here, because. It'll be relevant to that discussion. Who knows who the, <laughs> I have to ask the right question. Who knows the name of the president of the Senate pro temp at this moment? Joe Biden. The president of the Senate pro temp is Orrin Hatch. And, and the reason that that's important is that in the line of succession, after the vice president is the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate pro temp. So if something happened tomorrow to Mr. Obama and Mr. Biden and Mr. Ryan, Warren Hatch would be president of the United States. That's unbelievable. <laughs> but it's tough. Not keep your Southern <laughs> That must come from the television program. So, anyway, historically, the president of the Senate pro tem is the oldest member of the majority party. What kind of thinking is that? Do you remember Carl Hayden, the senator from Arizona? That poor guy? I mean, he was 96 when he died. I think when he finally stepped down from being president of the Senate pro tem, he was 92. He didn't even know where he was. The last, the last Democratic senator who was president pro tem was Patrick Leahy. A neighboring state who's running again. That's fine, but he shouldn't be president of the Senate pro <laughs> tem. Anyway, let's take our break. Let's come back and tell it. So there's been mentioned, I don't know how many of you remember, somebody mentioned the Hatch Act in this business about uh, Comey. Uh, so on TV the other night, the other day, I saw there was an interview with Trey Gowdy, that uh, the guy who chaired the uh, latest committee against uh, uh, investigating the Clinton's emails. And he was asked about it, and he said, quote unquote, it was laughable uh, the Hatch Act thing was laughable because, among other things, President Obama was running around the country campaigning for, uh, uh, for, for Hill. Well, Mr. Gowdy is a, an elected congressman. I think he should know that the Hatch Act does not apply to the President of the United States and to a bunch of other uh, uh, people. Uh, so it's another indication of, uh, you know, people who uh, have things to say that uh, uh, simply just wrong. And, uh, you know, rarely, if ever, does the person who's asking the question say, 
No, that's not the case. Well, let's look at the, uh, I, I, one other thing. Somebody asked me about this, and I'll just make the statement. Uh, on December 5th, uh, there is a panel that OSHA is sponsoring. It's free, uh, and it's in the Filane Room of the Moore Building, which is Filane. Well, where I come from Boston, and let me tell you, it's not Filane, it's Filane, and uh, so in any event, it's in that room. And uh, it's from 4.30 to 6, uh, and they have a, it was originally supposed to be Bob Coster, uh, he now can't make it, but they have a reporter from the Times, New York Times, a reporter from, um, I think the Wall Street Journal, and then a uh, professor from the, the uh, Dartmouth Political Science Department, which they have asked me to moderate. So um, anyway, that's the 5th of December uh, at 4.30, no charge. Um, and uh, so uh, that should be uh, interesting. <laughs> well, the topic is looking forward. What? Where are we going? <laughs> it is not a post-mortem, <laughs> but there may not be anything to post-mortem. So uh, I don't know. But the planned topic is, uh, you know, what do we do now? And uh, which I think is probably an interesting question. So anyway. Uh, th these are the times numbers, which have been slightly different uh, all along, um, and uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I think it's worth looking at a couple of things. Uh, uh, where the race has shifted. Uh, here they have the Democrats having a 59% chance of winning the Senate. We really haven't spent a lot of time talking about the Senate and those races. Uh, let me tell you for whatever it's worth, and it probably isn't worth much, my own take is that the best that the Democrats, I think, are going to do is to break even to elect 50 senators. I think that was, is probably uh, what I think is that's the strongest likelihood. I think. Does that include the two independents? I'm sorry. Does that include the two it independents? Does. It does. Yes. We really haven't talked much about what happens if Clinton and Kane win, and Kane has to vacate his seat. <laughs> well, that, there's a uh, that's an interesting question, but because there's a Democratic governor of Virginia, then the likelihood is they're going to appoint someone who is a Democrat, so that will not impact the... Uh, How long would he serve? He would serve election? until the next One election. Year. One year. Uh, in other words, there'll be a race next year for that seat. Bob? There's a piece in the paper in the Valley News this morning um, listing what will happen uh, or what is likely to happen in that circumstance. Fine, so... so we, through sort of three steps of right. what will happen right away <clears throat> But I think that's not like that. That won't impact the immediate, um, the immediate situation. So let's go back down here. And again, uh, so this doesn't change our. You know, these are the states which are much more democratic. Uh, these are the somewhat more over here for the Republicans. Uh, and obviously, these states in yellow are clearly uh, those swing states. And depending upon who you talk to, some of these states may be <coughs> swing states. Uh, these numbers don't reflect that, but um, in any event, my take is uh, Georgia and Arizona are certainly going to go Republican. Uh, uh, I think, I don't know about Florida. Uh, Ohio, I think, is going to go Republican. Iowa will go Republican. Maine in that district will probably go Republican. Um, and uh, Nevada, well, you know, one of the things we, we've talked about a little bit about the Afro-American vote, we haven't talked about the Hispanic vote. 
And to the extent that I've seen uh, polling data, it appears that the Hispanic vote, at least in some states, is uh, very significant and heavily uh, pro-Democrat. That's true, I think, in Nevada. Uh, I think it remains to be seen whether it's true in Florida. Will the up, will the raise or rise in the uh, Hispanic vote in Florida for Clinton offset the loss with the uh, African American vote? I don't know the answer. Uh, who's going to stay home? Did the Comey emails, uh, excuse me, the Comey message help to possibly suppress the vote? Will people simply say, I can't take any more of this, <laughs> and I'm just going to sit home because I, I just can't take it. So uh, I, I think, you know, there are some people who believe that uh, that, that may be uh, that may be the case. Uh, so, now, here we go to the, I think, the more interesting uh, chart, because what this shows is here you get to 272 votes. Um, and note here that, uh, you know, the last one on this list is uh, Colorado. North Carolina is not on the list. Nevada is not on this list. Uh, we'll see that Ohio is not on this list. Uh, but New Hampshire's on the list. Uh, and uh, Michigan's on the list. Wisconsin, Minnesota, New Mexico, and of course, Pennsylvania. I think Pennsylvania is a huge uh, uh, factor in this campaign. Ohio, uh, I think, is, as I say, I think Ohio is forget. Uh, but I think Pennsylvania is important because those 20 votes are critical. Should Trump win in Ohio, hey, in Pennsylvania, uh, that will not be uh, a good sign. If we pull this up a little further, That's a little too far. A lot of red states here. A lot of red states. So, well, so here is what I here is what I said. The 272 is here. So these are all states theoretically. If the others came the way of the polls now show, then Trump could win all of these states. Uh, which includes Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, Nevada, and still lose the election. So it's possible. It's possible. And of course, depending upon how you flip it, um, uh, if there are a couple of states, excuse me, a couple of votes, three votes lost here from somewhere, uh, and three is not an easy number, uh, to subtract from this Democratic total at this point, uh, then it would be 269 uh, to 269. Uh, so. Now, well. So if, I don't. I, I don't know how many of you go on and, and uh, you know, fool with these. Uh, I think that um, I did want to show you one other thing, and I've, where is it here? I seem to have lost it. Let me see if I can find it. Well, I'm not going to, who will, uh, basically, what I wanted to show you was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the polls across. The bookies are down basically now to something a little under 90%. So 
the odds have definitely dropped uh, a bit, but uh, they're still betting. Uh, they're not betting, but uh, they're they're uh, they're taking action uh, on uh, on the election. Any comments on this? Yeah, you said that the that both of the people really know. Yes, well, historically, they have been right. I haven't looked to see who they think is going to win tonight. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's really important. <laughs> so, um, anyway, let me uh, change course here for a sec, if I may, and talk to you a little bit about uh, the Electoral College. Uh, we've had conversations about this before, um, and uh, let me see here. If I can. Come on. So, let me uh, move over here and uh, talk to you a little bit about this. Uh, come on, come on. So this is something that uh, we, we've had on the board or something like this before, uh, which is the discussion about what happens uh, at various points in time, if a candidate dies or withdraws, um, if a candidate disappears for whatever reason. So uh, the question is, um, how are these things resolved? And there are some that are easier than others. The first one. Uh, if a candidate dies or withdraws before the election, before November 8th, then it's the party's responsibility to do something. Imagine if this happened between now and November 8th with two, three, four, five, six days to go. I mean, it's a nightmare. So because the ballots are all printed, Everything's all done. What would have people so what would have to happen? Because they I, I don't think they would postpone the election. What would has to have to happen is that the party would have to get together, <coughs> the national committee of the party involved would have to get together and uh, come up with something to tell their voters. Either they would have to move the vice presidential candidate up to the presidency, or they would have to replace the president candidate with another person. And they would then have to make an announcement to everybody that it's that person that you would be voting for in the election. Nice problem. Uh, but that's, I think, the, the practical answer. Yes? What happens to the early voting? <laughs> That's a very nice question. And I don't know the answer uh, because we could have a quarter or more of the people who could have already voted. So one answer is that those people will be assumed to have voted for their candidate. The other answer is that all those ballots will be thrown out and not counted. Uh, and who's going to make that decision? So e theoretically, theoretically, each state would need to make a decision. And if 12 states say this and 38 states say that, that's another interesting question. And I, Aren't you really just voting for the electors anyhow? You are. But the electors have to know yeah, so, so yes, you are voting for the electors. So that would be the response. 
You're not voting for these people, you're voting for the electors, which will surprise 90% of the people. <laughs> and uh, you are sending a message to the electors. That's correct. So, yes, Matt Maria. Did you hear about the uh, bullet hole in Hillary Clinton's magazine uh, front page of someone? No. I, I can't remember all the, uh, you know. This was a, a picture of a bullet hole or a real one? Uh, it's a picture of a bullet hole. I well, I don't know. I don't know. I, but I, it was mentioned on, the, on one of these uh, talk shows. I, I have not. Yes, just yesterday. Just yesterday. Comment? Let me kind of try and run. Running through these is not easy. But let's see if we can get through them. Uh, so the second one is what happens if there's a death or a withdrawal between the election in November and the Electoral College voting on December 19th? That's roughly six weeks. Roughly six weeks. Uh, and so what's the answer to that? Well, the um, so the first question is, the election, let's for the moment assume it produced a winner, and if the winner was the one, if the loser <coughs> dies, then it doesn't make any difference. In fact, that actually happened once in American history, when uh, Horace Greeley ran, lost the election, died before the Electoral College vote, and uh, um, <coughs> so, <coughs> and then the Electoral College was completely flummoxed um, because they didn't know who to vote for, uh, and some <coughs> voted for him, and some voted for, but anyway. But if the winner were to die, uh, that would create uh, another story. And the, the, the first question is, is this person the president-elect at that time? Has that person been elected? So that's a very nice question. And the answer to it is, is that nobody knows. And the reason nobody knows is that that issue has never been litigated. And our good friends on the Supreme Court might then, might then come into play, and they would have to uh, opine uh, on whether this person was, in fact, the president uh, elect. Now, why does it make a difference if it's the president elect? Because if then it's the president elect, then there, uh, it's if it's the president elect who died, then they would be subject to the twentieth amendment, and the twentieth amendment is the amendment which sets forth. What happens uh, when um, these uh, matters uh, occur? So uh, the let me find the right page here. <clears throat> Sorry. I have it here. Go here to death after inauguration. Clearly, 
that becomes the subject of uh, the uh, Presidential Succession Act, and the vice president would become the president. There was actually uh, William Henry Harrison back in the mid 1800s uh, was uh, inaugurated. It was raining like hell. He made a big speech out in the rain, and he died 30 days later from pneumonia. And the vice president became president. That was, of course, before there was a succession act. Uh, but that uh, has actually happened, I mean, shortly after. So the vice president would become president, and then the vice president would appoint someone to be the new vice president. And that person would be, have to be approved by a majority of both the House and the Senate. Now, how many times has that happened in our history? It's happened twice. It happened when Agnew resigned and Nixon appointed Jerry Ford, and it happened when Ford became president and he appointed Nelson Rockefeller after considering Melvin Ladd and I forget who the other candidate was. But in any event, it happened twice. So uh, that, that's a, uh, a relatively easy one. Now let's take the, uh, the business between Congress and the inauguration, I think is also relatively easy. Because clearly, uh, that person is the, I say clearly, I believe that person is the president-elect, even though he hasn't been nominated. He hasn't been inaugurated. And I believe what would happen here is the same thing that happened here. The vice president would be uh, uh, basically inaugurated, and then he would have to appoint somebody uh, who would be approved by both the Senate and the House. Uh, and so uh, that is one which I think we can also uh, see. Now, uh, here, uh, the death between the uh, Electoral College voting and the Congressional voting uh, is also, I think, there's about a two week time period in there because the Electoral College voting is December 19th. And the uh, voting for the, uh, the congressional voting is January 3rd. So that's a two-week period. But among other things, Christmas and New Year's fall into that period. And so there's a lot of other things going on in the world. Uh, I think here again, the likely, uh, likely, not, it's not guaranteed, but the likely situation is that the um, uh, that uh, the vacancy would be ruled as having a president elect, and that they would uh, go through uh, that process. So that leaves us really with this uh, more uh, difficult question between the election and the Electoral College uh, voting. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's a question that uh, I think could be uh, litigated. Uh, there's no, uh, I think, easy answer. Uh, and I think that um, it would be interesting, interesting is the wrong word, if any of these issues get before the Supreme Court, it's not going to be interesting. It's going to be very unfortunate. Uh, because obviously there are only eight people. Uh, it is likely, not impossible, but likely that a federal appeals court, will, a circuit court, will already have heard this argument. The appeals court consists of three judges, typically. And so they will have made a decision 
which will then go to the Supreme Court for review. And I think the odds are very strong that the vote of the Supreme Court will be four to four. And that means that the decision of the appeals court will be the vote that stays uh, and that basically decides who <coughs> the President uh, of the United States will be. Now, that raises an interesting question because there are 12 or 13 districts in the country with appeals courts. And some of these appeals courts are more liberal and some are more conservative. So where do you bring this case? <laughs> <clears throat> well, and uh, which raises a nice question. And uh, so all of these questions are uh, uh, not <clears throat> easily answered. Um, and then, of course, we come to the situation, and again, we've talked about this before, but I think it's, it's worth mentioning, the remote possibility that for one reason or another, the election is thrown into the House of Representatives and the Senate. Remember, it will be the new House and the new Senate that will vote on these matters. The new House, uh, each state gets one vote. So as I've said before, in New Hampshire, if we still had a Republican and Democratic Congress person, I don't think that'll happen, but if it happened, uh, then the Republican and Democrat would basically, presumably, knock one another out, and New Hampshire wouldn't have a vote. And that's, uh, so, in, in California, if there are 55, or I think it's 55 votes, then they'd add up the Republicans and add up the Democrats, and uh, the one who has the most votes uh, would, if it was a majority of the uh, votes uh, would in fact get uh, the single vote for that state, California. Yes? Is there any way, uh, we don't know who the electorate will vote for, is that right? Well, that's a nice question because we do and we don't. In 29 states, the electors, the electors are either bound by law to vote for uh, the, the man who won the election in their state, or they pledged to the party that they would vote for that person. But in the other 21 states, there's no such rule. And in a very interesting case, in 1968, uh, when George Wallace uh, was on the ballot, there was an elector in one of the southern states, I think it was South Carolina, who was pledged to Nixon. And he decided he was going to vote for Wallace. So his vote was cast for Wallace, and it went to the Congress, and the House and the Senate each debated about this separately. And they both came back and said, that vote should be counted for George Wallace. Now that's the only time that Congress has come to that conclusion on something like that, but there's some precedent there. That didn't make any difference because Wallace had 47 or 48 votes. It wasn't a big deal. I know this is a a long-winded answer to your question. But the fact is that there's no guarantee, I suggest to you, that the electors are going to vote for whom they say they were going to vote for. And in this case, if Mr. McMullen were to win in Utah, he would also be a possible candidate in the House. So the electors, Republican or Democrat, could say, gee, this guy's an interesting guy. Why don't we cast our ballots for Mr. McMullen? And while it's perhaps not likely that he could be elected, 
he could get enough votes to prevent the other candidates, candidates, well, we're talking about because this, there's no one dead here at this point. He could get enough votes to prevent anybody else from being elected. And the way the rules are written, Congress has to remain in session and keep voting on this until they make a decision. And back in the day, it took, they took 36 ballots with Jefferson and, uh, no, with Adams, with Jefferson and uh, Burke, thank you, uh, before they decided. It went on for weeks, literally weeks. So what happens here is that if Congress can't, if the House can't make a decision by January 20th, then the Vice President would be inaugurated as the acting president. Now, let me draw this out one further <laughs> One further roll. If, uh, if the Senate is 50-50, which it could very well be, then who, what happens if the vote is 50-50? Well, the, the one section of the Constitution says that the Vice President shall break all ties in the Senate. But somewhere else in the Constitution it says only senators can vote on this matter. A majority of the senators. There's another interesting case for our friends on the Supreme Court. I mean, I can't make this stuff up. So I could, but I'm not. So I guess what I'm saying here is this is really, uh, you know, I mean, this is a possible national nightmare. If you think Mr. Trump has talked about a rigged system before, imagine what he could carry on uh, with all of this. So, uh, I mean, I, the likelihood of all this happening is remote, but it's not impossible. And what, with what we've seen <laughs> in this election, I wouldn't bet against it. Um, so uh, I think that you had a comment. I had a comment. I got a question. I like things simple. Why wouldn't it, where it's a national vote, it wouldn't just, uh, the death would be replaced by the next highest person in this party? <coughs> I think that, uh, I mean, the answer is, uh, on, on which one of these are you talking about? Well, I can understand on the president, but when you're dealing with Congress, there's usually more than one just running for that position. I mean, if the first one that was elected dies, I would think it would be just a natural uh, second place. Well, elected. we're not talking here about congressmen or senators. This is really only because of the electoral college that this comes into play. Yeah, but why would he even go to it? Well, because the electoral college is the, those are the people who make the decision. Remember the basic underlying principle, which is so important to all of this, is there is no constitutional right or federal law for us to vote for president, impossible as that may sound. There is nothing in the Constitution that says the president shall be elected by the people or by a popular, it doesn't say that. It says they shall be elected by the electors who are to be elected the way each state <laughs> says they're to be elected. So that's how we get to these arcane, and admittedly, arcane questions. And as I say, there are no simple answers. Uh, you had a? Yeah, uh, a little different wrinkle. Yeah. If the matter went to the Supreme Court, uh, do you think that the Supreme Court would look at it in and decide in an intellectual way, or do you think it would be 
nothing more than party lines, IP. Well, we have we have a we have a couple of problems, and I think we've raised this before in class. The first question is, would Ruth Bader Ginsburg recuse herself? Um, because certainly Mr. Trump would be screaming in the background. She's got to recuse herself because she insulted me and she apologized, and she's clearly, uh, you know, she clearly has a bias. You know, there's a strong point to be made there. So that's the first question. And, and I don't know whether she'd recuse herself or not. She doesn't have to. Scalia has said far more about that. Uh, well, and he's passed us. So, uh, so I think my answer to your question is that, like it or not, the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court, if not others, uh, has become politicized. And uh, so I think that they would be well aware of uh, what they were doing and looking at the members of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, I would say that we could all pretty much guarantee how they would, you know, depending upon the question, the likelihood of their coming four to four, I think the names would be pretty much the same. Uh, you know, I don't see Justice Thomas voting with Justice Sotomayor on that map. No, but not gonna have guy is Kennedy for the moment. <clears throat> well, but he's not a swing on four to four. In fact, he could be a swing to make it five to three. So, I mean, that's the swing that, you know, could happen. And he was the swing in the Bush v. Gore case. So, uh, anyway. Having a popular vote would solve a lot of these problems. <laughs> it would. And that's another story. So, we're, you know, I don't know about you, but all of this is exhausting and frustrating. And uh, I don't mean to um, kind of burden you with this. But let me try and conclude by with just a, a couple of, I'm going to hand out these little ballots uh, for you. I hope you'll have fun and participate before you leave. Uh, these are, your, I'm asking you to, to submit your estimate of the popular vote for Clinton and, and uh, Trump and your estimate of the uh, um, electoral vote. And uh, then just put your name down. Uh, and then turn them into me, and we're going to, uh, at the next class, we're going to have a, uh, uh, here, thank you. want them on separate points, correct? No, no, you put, put them on one page. Uh, if you just put the percentages in, because I have no idea what the total yeah. is. Yeah. You can put the percentage of uh, popular vote in a percentage, yeah. and it, actually, I think there may not be enough to go across, but there, there are Voter about... suppression. Voter suppression. <laughs> but, <laughs> Nobody knows more about that than I do. <laughs> so, let me try and close out this kind of little piece by saying this. If the election were held today, I think Hillary would win the popular vote by 3, 4 percent. So, I think she'd win the electoral vote by some, by more than one or two, but not certainly by a hundred. By, you know, maybe just short of 300, maybe around. I think what I see now, what I feel, is that. I, I, does everybody have one? These are, these are very important and rare. Uh, they're going to be saved for the Smithsonian. So be sure and put your name on. The total electoral is 538. 270 is the number to win. For the popular vote, do you want to make it a two-person race? or Yes, two-person. Well, I think, I think, you know, there were 200 million registered voters. If 60% of the people voted, which would be the highest in many years, that would be 120 million. Uh, so you could say 65 to 60, or, you know, whatever you wanted to say. I think having the third parties involved is confusing and not necessary. 
That's one um, out of every five votes. I was just looking on something, and they were talking about mm -hmm. the electoral votes, and they had like 241.5. Where is that? I have, I can't imagine this. There's no such thing as a point five. There are single electoral votes for a congressional district in Maine and a congressional district in Nebraska, but that's it. There are no half electoral votes. I'll, I'll look at it afterwards if, if you'd like. I'm happy to go. So let me just kind of try and wind this up because I feel as though, you know, as I've said before, one of Churchill's greatest quotes was, I prefer to prophecy after the event. Uh, and I certainly prefer to prophecy after the event. So I think that today, she would win, and she'd win the, the Electoral College, not by a huge amount. I think that these next six days are unknowable. And there's another thing called momentum. And I really feel as the, mo the momentum has shifted. Hillary had momentum before the, we were, we were, uh, before we were uh, comitose. <laughs> and uh, that momentum has definitely shifted. In many elections, presidential elections, there is a uh, coming together of the votes. But as I, I said in answer to a question I think last week, there has never been an election in which the candidate was ahead by as much as Hillary was ahead by a week, 10 days ago, where that lead has been uh, lost. Now, so here's my takeaway. I think without knowing any of this about crisis or turnout, I mean without knowing any more than we know now, um, that this is likely to continue to come together. And it's not impossible that the night before the election or day before that we could be in a virtual tie. I think that is at least possible. I, at the moment, I don't see much that's going to change this momentum. I, I don't see much that is likely to change. It might stop. It might just stop at two or two and a half or whatever and that it won't move any further. But I think we're in for a nail biter. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of things that can happen in this election that, excuse me, that we, we just didn't know about. There's the things for Trump are, you know, this unknown number of people in the country who are just going to vote for change. They don't give a damn. They're going to go out and vote for change. And we've said all along, that was the single biggest thing he had done. So it, that shouldn't be a surprise um, in that sense, the vote for change. Uh, then there's this other thing going on with Trump. And I won't go into that. We've talked about it. Uh, but clearly, uh, there are people who are leaving aside the change, who are mad, who are uh, unhappy, uh, and clearly there's a large group of people who hate the Clintons, and that's another fact. Um, so then on the other side, with Hillary, what about the turnout? Who is going to come out? Are the millennials going to come out and vote? Whether they're white or, or black or Hispanic, are Asian, are those people going to come out and vote, or are they going to sit at home? You know, I wish I had the answer to that question, but I don't have it. Yeah. And Eva? Uh, we had asked earlier about the um, African American turnout in 2004. Yes. 2012. And in 
2004 it was 60 percent, in 2008 65 percent, and in 2012 66 percent. Okay, thank you. So it was five or six percent. Yeah, that's up significant. So, right, so that's a big ray, rise, mm -hmm. and as we said, is the, is the Hispanic, remember we looked at charts, which showed the difference between the black and the Hispanic vote, and the Hispanic vote was significantly lower, and if the Hispanic vote goes up five or six percent, then that might, uh, you know. Uh, well, that's the population that has increased the most. Yes, that's correct. So that but they have traditionally effect. been fewer votes. Yeah. So, I, I'm sorry, Laura. Quick question. God forbid there's a domestic attack. Who's, who, who does that favor? Well, we could argue that. In my view, that favors Trump. Because I think it's a terrorism question. It's the issue of the borders aren't closed. And, uh -huh. and, uh, and um, you know, the likelihood of it being somebody from, you know, uh, from uh, Iraq is remote. But that doesn't make any difference. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, there were what? How many people shot in Chicago over the last weekend? An unbelievable number. And uh, so, I mean, I think anything could happen here. And there we have, <laughs> we have a large share of mentally ill people in this country who could do anything at any time. We've seen that. It has nothing to do with politics at all. But the people who are in politics make it have something to do. Yes, I'm sorry. What, what, Sam? What about Republican women? Well, I think, you know, I mean, we heard the Republican women were voting. Was that Republicans or Republican women? Just Republicans. So, yeah, we've heard that Republican women are, are not going to vote for Trump and they're going to vote for Hillary. But I don't know in what numbers. That certainly could make a difference. That's the thing that could make a difference in Pennsylvania. That's the thing that will make a difference in other states. Uh, and as I say, I think, you know, the question is, what's going to happen between now and Tuesday? And uh, I think, uh, you know, if you want to flip a few coins, uh, you know, you can do that. Brian, you had another question. No, just a, a comment if I could. Sure. Know, I thought this would be appropriate this time. He shall mention the great satirist yes. and purveyor of the American scene. I'll leave you with this. As democracy is perfected, the office of the president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of this wonderful land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, I gotta tell you, I hope you're all here. Uh, you know, uh, bring, uh, you know, bring drinks and uh, whatever happens. Hopefully, we won't uh, have uh, this kind of uh, discussion. There'll be no need to really worry about the electoral college. Uh, I will try and uh, uh, amuse you occasionally over the next four or five days if there's anything amusing to say. And uh, I thank you for your interest. So if you will, yes, if you pass the balance down and uh,